Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It must not suffer, no. Hello, everybody. So welcome to the Walter Jones Show. I'm he. It is a evening edition, baby. Another board teaching uh, today, uh, Monday. It's Monday night, and uh, those of you who are around, come on in. Come on in. Let's talk about this first fruit. Some of you are talking about some. Well, El Jones, you were standing in front of the board the whole time last time, so I'm gonna get out the way, so I won't lose any more Facebook friends. All right? Bam! There's the board right there. Mm -hmm. There's a good shot. I want you to pay attention to it. Take a snapshot of it if you have to. Today, I may not have to erase the board. Here it is. We're talking about the first fruits. The first fruits as it pertains to the Old Testament. First fruits of the New Testament. And uh, do you have to practice the first fruit offerings? All right. Okay. Good to see you all over here. I see quite a few of you there. Let's get this teaching on going. All right. I have a book here. It was given to me by a dear friend of mine. And those of you who write books, those of you who have ideas for books, send them to me. I love books. This is called The Feasts of the Lord. It is by Kevin Howard and Marvin Rosenthal. It's one of my favorite books in my library. And it talks about the feasts of the Lord as we study in the Old Testament what God did for his people, the Jewish people. Passover, then Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the Feast of First Fruits, and then Shavuot, which is the Feast of Weeks, and then Rosh Hash, uh, Hashanah. That's always a tongue tie for me. And of course, that's the Feast of Trumpets, by the way. Yom Kippur, that's the Day of Atonement, and uh, Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? And then there's some additional observances that's in here to uh, Tisha B. Av, which is the fast of the fifth month, and Hanukkah, y'all have heard a lot about that, the Feast of Dedication, and Purim was the Feast of Lots, and of course the Jubilee year, and, and, and on and on. The book is filled with great information on the feasts. Today I want to focus more so on the Feast of the First Fruits, and why was it important then and why it is not to be observed today the way y'all are observing it today. Hear me. You can observe the feasts all you want to. It's up to you. Like my, my uh, study that I did uh, over the weekend over the um, How to Tithe in 2019. If you missed that teaching, go on my YouTube channel. And there you'll see the teaching on, on my channel about tithing in 2019, proper tithing. And for some of you that doing it the old way, it, it's probably going to shock some of you. But here, it, it opens up, Kevin Howard talks about one division of systematic theology. In this book, he says, or major biblical doctrines, this is known as eschatology, or literally the study of last things. Eschatology is one of my favorite of systematic theology. Uh, this vital area of biblical doctrine delves into future prophetic scriptures, uh, events in scriptures, which are uh, as, like the rapture of the church or the day of the Lord, the return of the Messiah, the restoration of Israel and the messianic, uh, messianic kingdom. And the entire study is devoted to what's called the last things. And although not a major discipline, nor often examined, the subject of first fruit or first, or first things is one about which the Bible has much to say about first things. The Bible has a lot to say about it, okay? Um, somewhat obscure and essentially unobserved for almost 2,000 years. Did you hear that? Unobserved for 2,000 years. Israel's feasts of first fruits was an ancient holy day solely devoted to first things. And its powerful message and timeless truth provide a rich study for God's people today. 
there's a word that's going to come up in my teaching today. Uh, it's called replacement theology. And many of you who practice first fruits practice replacement theology. And I need you to be extremely careful on when you do this because there's, there are usually problems that follow behind that. The meaning of the first fruits he brings up, he says, um, first fruits mark the beginning of the cereal grain harvest in Israel. And bear, uh, uh, barley was the first grain to ripen of those sown in the winter months. Barley, the first part, all right? for that season and so for first fruits a sheaf of the barley was harvested and brought to the temple as a thanksgiving offering to the lord for the harvest and it was representative of the barley harvest as a whole and served as a pledge or guarantee that the remainder of the harvest would be realized in the days that followed you hear me for those of you who are uh, following first fruits, it's supposed to be a guarantee of your next payday, uh, 15th or the 30th, or, or your next um, quarter, the next three months, okay? Your next fiscal year, all right, of, of returns, of revenue, of income. It's supposed to be a guarantee. And is it not? Or is it being guaranteed to many of you? Well, it remains to be seen. But it says a very important thing towards the end here because it's talking about Jewish practices today. And I'm going to tell you what it says at the end of this chapter. It says the modern observation. The modern observation. Here's what it says. First fruit sacrifices and offerings are not offered today. Guess why it's not offered today by the Jewish people? Why it's not observed? You ask a Jew and you talk to him about some of the things that the Christians do in their temples, they laugh at us. One thing is tithe. They do not tithe. Not the way y'all tithe today. They don't tithe to a temple. They give an offering for the upkeep of their synagogues. But the Orthodox, I'm talking about them real Jews, they don't tithe. For the same reason why they do not observe first fruits. You know why? The book says, since there is no temple. You're like, well, surely there are temples all over the place. Surely there are temples. No, there is no national temple. And where is that temple? It is their homeland in Israel. At least the place where they call Israel. I think there's some strangers over there. And they call it Middle East. I don't believe that is the Middle East, I believe Israel, actually in 1948, you know, the Israel is supposed to have been in another territory. Actually, it's supposed to have been in, in uh, parts of, of uh, Africa, um, but that's another, that's another show. So the only first fruits ritual which has survived to modern times has been the counting of the Omer, the days from first fruit to Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. That's about it. On the 33rd day of the period, a minor holiday called Lag B. Omer is celebrated. The first word of this holiday is, com is a combination of the Hebrew letters Lamed and Gemel. Okay, that's a whole story there. That's a whole nother sh study. All right. So those of you who are doing th this OT type of first fruits, and picking and borrowing from some of the things I'm going to talk about in the New Testament, when you try and combine this, you are going to find yourself in a problem. Okay? Blessing to you, Tamara. You're going to find yourself in a problem. Why? Because remember the show I did where I did a circle and I talked about the, uh, the kingdom of God. Remember I did that show? And then I talked about the body of Christ. Remember when I did that show? Y'all remember that, right? And I talked about how God operates counterclockwise, uh, not clockwise, because uh, Ecclesiastes talk about uh, 3 and 15. I, think, I guess you can go there or you can go, or you go to chapter 1. Talk about the things that has been is now, 
okay? He, he talking in reverse. He looked at the end of your life and he began to determine the beginning. He began to write out the beginning of your life, your pre-life, as he saw the end of it. Understand that? Adam was in the garden, but Adam being in the garden was really a setup because of what happened in heaven. God already knew what he was going to do. So here, the kingdom of God, this is the Old Testament. The body of Christ is the New Testament. The Old Testament, I talked about how it's not first natural. That's what's going on here. Natural. And this is spirit. When you don't, if you can't separate them, you're going to have a problem. The Old Testament is the New Testament, but it's concealed in natural things and in relics. And in the 613 laws uh, and, uh, and, and the, the, the front, even the furniture in the temple and even the manna uh, from heaven and all these things. All these things were concealed because it was revealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed when who revealed it? Christ revealed it on the cross. So then when you see in the gospel of John, he kept saying, I am. I am the way. I am the truth, all this. I am the life. I am the temple. I am the manna, okay? And I, I am all these things. So the Jews were hooked up, still hooked to the old way of, of life. And many of you who are borrowing from the Jewish way, you're still hooked on an old way. You're still hooked on some of these things are dead things. Uh -huh. But these things are natural things, and so you're living after the flesh. You're walking and living after the fleshly thing. But the New Testament talks about walking after the spirit. The flesh is warring or lusting after the spirit. And it says and vice versa. Understand? The law of God is encamped here. The law was good. But the Apostle Paul said that the law showed me, my, uh, showed me something. That sin was in me. And Christ showed the law the same thing. So what Christ did was took the law, took a dead thing, took a thing that God knew that man could not obey, and he placed it all into Christ. And now that man looks at Christ, the spirit looks at Christ, and he can't break all of these laws. He don't have to do ceremonial washes. He don't have to um, uh, kill a turtle dove or a bullock or a red heifer or roast a lamb whole. He don't have to do all these things and, and stone people for doing certain things. Why? That's an old, natural, fleshly thing. That's the kingdom of God. Don't worry about them. God is going to rescue them in the millennial time of dispensation. Don't worry about them. This, uh, these are their people, God's people, that is. When we get to the New Testament, then we have been grafted into these people, grafted in. God wanted these people separated from the world. He told them, no, women, the men don't even marry these pagan women and vice versa. All right. Don't eat their foods and don't worship their gods. And they kept doing this thing. They kept going against God and God kept punishing them. And so he says, I'm going to make, I'm going to, to, to present to you a savior. And he, but he, pro, he proclaimed that the Gentiles were coming as well. And they did come. But I'm going to read something here. Because what happens is when they did come, then they made these people jealous. <laughs> Over what? The same Savior. All right? Anybody following this? I know this is a little a much for some of you. First fruit is an increase. No increase. No fruit. Making 15. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, a lot of his teachings you can learn on. Yes. Good. Thank you, sir. Uh, I know I'm late, but you uh, can you back away from the board so I can? <laughs> I told y'all. I told y'all. Some people are gonna say back away from the board. If you came in early, you'd have saw a full shot. All right, there it is. There's the shot. Get the shot. Okay. All right. So that's the kingdom of God. The Hebrew people. That's the body of Christ. Those are in Christ. All right. There are Messianic Jews. Um, don't worry about that. But you gotta separate these two for you to understand the scriptures. All right. If my people, which are called by my name. He wasn't talking to these people. He was talking to these people. And specifically, he was talking to King Solomon. But you got to read the whole chapter to see why he was talking about my people. He was talking about a kingdom people. All right. There's no such thing as Christian dumb. 
because if there's a Christendom, that means there's one head over that king. We don't have a head to go to. But in in this kingdom, there was a king. It, these kings were men. These kings were men. They rejected God. Okay? So God never called us Christian. Jesus never called us Christian. Christian was a derogatory term. All right? Used, uh, first used in Antioch. And even though Apostle Paul used the, t the word, okay, it still was derogatory. We are the body of Christ or we are sons. Now we are kings and we are priests. All right. We're all these great things. Not Christian. Uh-huh. Y'all see what I'm saying here. All right. And so it's like calling some of my Hispanic friends. Uh, we used to call them Chicanos. Well, they're not Chicanos. It's like calling some of you black people uh, the N-word. Okay? They, like, they were just, the, and y'all have used the N-word now as a, as a, a buddy uh, way of ebonically talking, okay? That, you my, okay, I can't even say it, all right? Terms of endearment. Should Christians today give a, a, a first fruit offering? And the first fruit offering was an offering required by God of the Israelites. It's mentioned several times in the Old Testament, uh, Exodus 23 and 19. The best of the first, uh, uh, first fruits of the ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. The best. Uh, Leviticus 23 and 10 says, And speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest to the priest. Understand that y'all, these people come from bondage. They come from Israel and God was taking them to a place that they did not prepare. He prepared it for them. Can you, the New Testament church, actually say this? Can you really say this? Leviticus, uh, Proverbs, uh, where am I? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 3 and 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. And then your barns will be filled with, with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth. But it's like after he said wealth, he didn't say money or coins or shekels. Okay. He he, uh, he didn't use he didn't use money. He still went back to food. Um, the most comprehensive passage about the first fruit offering is found in Deuteronomy 26. It's extremely comprehensive, and read that on your own. It explains the f purpose of the first fruit was to acknowledge how God took the Israelites down to Egypt, multiplied their number, released them. And gave them the land of Canaan for an inheritance. And Canaan was a fertile land that was already settled by people who did horrible things like sacrifice their children. And so for this sin, God had the Israelites destroy the Canaanites and then he gave the Israels the land. So when y'all are doing first fruits today, is this your testimony? Some of y'all say, yeah, well, slavery happened and they were killing our kids. And so, but did you destroy the slave owner? Did you? Okay. God told the Israelites that the first fruits offering was to be given in thanks for cities that you did not build and houses full, uh, full of all good things that you did not feel and cisterns that you did not dig. Well, many of you, I know a lot of you who build your houses from the ground up and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. I know a lot of y'all who are green thumbs, you know, you, y'all doing all of this, but they didn't have to. Deuteronomy 6 and 10 says the offering was brought to the temple where it was displayed before God and then given to the priests for their sustenance. So you're telling me to do first fruits and you're telling me to do tithes and you're telling me to do an offering. And then some of your leaders are telling you that offering is, the f I mean, that tithing is the first fruit. You see what's happening here? But in the scriptures, these are not uh, tithes. These are first fruits. And then God established, uh, talked about tithing separately. And then he talked about offering separately. So it's three things that God instructed the Jews to do. 
What y'all have done was you combine tithe with first fruit, and that's not what the scripture says. All right. The offering was brought to the temple. Uh, Numbers 18 and 11. Uh, Proverbs. Go back to Proverbs 3 and 9. Does say that offering offering first fruit will be blessing, but it's unclear if this is a general Proverbs or a specific promise of God to his people. In the majority of appearances, first fruit is associated with thanks to God not bringing the Israelite from Egypt to Canaan. Okay? To God for bringing the Israel. All right? That's what's going on. So I've seen somebody post Proverbs 3 and 9 on the page, but they couldn't explain it. Y'all stop posting stuff on my page and not explaining it. Okay? Can y'all please stop doing that? Explain it. <laughs> the people want to know. The law is somewhat vague in the specifics and has opened itself in the rubinic interpretation. For instance, scripture does not di dictate how much the first fruit offering should be in comparison to the harvest. It does not dictate that, how much it should be. Leviticus 23 and 17 mentions two loaves of bread for an offering of wheat. And rabbinic custom stated the minimum offering should be one sixtieth of the harvest. Are they teaching you this in your church? Although this is not the Bible, rabbis decided that only the seven speci um, species characteristic to Canaan were required. It goes on with wheat and barley and grapes and figs and pomegranates and olive oils and dates and honey. But it's always food, y'all. Always. Uh, the most significant aspect of the first fruit offering was the reason behind it. It was to uh, it was designed to acknowledge and thank God for providing the Israels with the land flowing with milk and honey after their captivity in Egypt. Some of y'all are still in a mental Egypt. Some of y'all are mentally enslaved. How do we know? We can tell by by the way y'all spend your money, by the way you waste your money. Uh, Y'all are great at consuming, but you're horrible at producing. And so Black Friday is filled with a whole bunch of believers at Walmart standing out there at 3 and 4 in the morning, rushing into there like it's heaven. Okay? The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. What are you taking? Toys and big screen TVs and shoes and, and all kind of stuff? That's what you're doing. Right. So you're becoming you're great at consuming the term first fruit is used in another uh, somewhat metaphorically way in the Old Testament. It refers to the firstborn son of each human man or female animal and all firstborn males belong to God. But depending on the species, they could be redeemed and that is a sacrifice could be made so they would could stay. All right. And this goes on and on. All right. Now, let's talk about the first fruit. In the New Testament. In the New Testament, it is spoken uh, seven times, but symbolically, as I did this setup in the early part of the show. It's spoken seven times symbolically to represent a harvest of souls only. Do you understand what, what I'm saying? It represents a harvest of souls. Remember, I keep talking about the New Testament is spirit, it's grace. It's about soul winning. This wasn't so much about soul winning. This is about obedience to God. They didn't really have a savior. Now the Holy Spirit did operate in the Old Testament. For those of you who teach that the, the, the Holy Spirit didn't operate in the Old Testament. I'm not sure how you can separate God from the Father, from the Son, from the Holy Spirit. They all were operating in the Old Testament. It's just that you saw a lot of theophany and pre-carnate. Pre operating and you saw the Holy Spirit operating in some of the men and the women in the scriptures. Okay? Um, gosh. What are you saying here? You can never be satisfied a greedy person and they will always want more. Ooh wee, Linda. Shame on you. <laughs> Tamara Tamara asked a great question. I'm gonna get to Tamara's question in a minute. What they created was threefold begging during uh, service. <laughs> threefold begging, threefold begging. Come on, Alexis. First fruit. The first, the first fruits are mentioned in in several ways in the New Testament. Romans eight and twenty three states, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the spirit, 
as in other passages, Paul is using first fruit as a metaphor for the first appearance of the promised blessing. Here it is the Holy Spirit, the helper, who Jesus promised. Remember when he blew on the disciples, he said, receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost. All right. He's going to come and he's going to bring all things to truth to you. You got to go to John 14 if you can. All right. The very first followers of Jesus were also the very first to experience the blessing of the indwelling of what or, or whom the Holy Spirit. And they received the first fruit of the Holy Spirit work in the lives of believers. That's what's happening here. And nothing about money there. It's about a harvest of souls. That's how you're supposed to be observing first fruits. You're not witnessing to anybody. You're not witnessing. You are the first fruit. All right? You got saved first in your family. You are the first fruit. Uh, in Romans 11, 13, Paul makes a, conf a, fusing, make a confusing statement in regards to the rejection of Jesus by the Jews. It was always God's intent to bring salvation to the Gentiles. Y'all read this Romans, start at Romans chapter 9, then go to chapter 10, and go to chapter 11, and read them together, and you'll see this confusing thing. I talked about the grafting in earlier in this teaching. It was not his intent that the Jews would reject the salvation. It was not his intent. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Who's us? These kingdom folks. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called. All right. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting father. Prince of peace. This is supposed to be Jesus. They call him Emmanuel. All right. As they were reading Isaiah or Isaiah. It confused even today's uh, Jew. Even today's Orthodox Jew. When he reads uh, Isaiah. He reads it just like this eunuch. Who was reading it in his chariot. This Ethiopian. Was reading it and says. Who is, who, is, who is this person talking? Is he talking about someone else? Or is he talking about himself? He was reading out of Isaiah. And that's what's happening here. And Paul is trying to help them see this. Uh, but since they have. Uh, they rejected salvation. God hopes that his new. Relationship with the Gentiles. Will make the Jews jealous. Envious. And caused them to want that relationship for themselves. So the Gentiles came on the scene, received Christ. Christ came from these people. They rejected him. So God says, I'm going to make sure that these people come on the scene. Go to Isaiah. And at the fullness of the Gentiles, they're going to come. They're going to receive me, but you're going to reject them. But these Gentiles, like some of you today, are also going to do a type of rejecting. Mm -hmm. Uh Apparently, some Gentile Christians turned their acceptance of Christ into pride and harassed the Jewish Christians. That's what some of you are doing, not just with Jews, but with others. They're not like us. Y'all have a Pharisee spirit. You are a nation of vipers because they don't worship in the same denomination as I'm Church of God in Christ. Or I'm apostolic. Or I'm Baptist. I'm Lutheran. I'm Presbyterian. I'm Catholic. I'm Mormon. I'm AME, I'm CME, okay? I, I, I'm non-denominational, uh, I'm full gospel, all right? It goes on and on and on, and this is segregation in the, in the, in the body of Christ. Y'all are segregationists, okay? And y'all are just as bad as uh, many of the ones that I see out there who are of the, uh, some, white evan some white evangelicals act the same way in the South. So you're doing the same thing that these people did, okay? Uh, and God, God is for all, and even the Gentiles who accepted Christ should not have treated the, the few Jewish Christians they came into contact with arrogantly. And that's what some of you are doing. Y'all don't do what we do. We do foot, feet wash on the first Sunday. We do communion the first Sunday. Y'all don't do that? Oh, how dare you? Okay. Verse 16 continues, If the dough offered as first fruit is holy, so is the whole lump. The phrasing is odd, but it's believed that the dough refers to the first Jewish Christians and the whole lump to Jews in general, meaning that God has not abandoned the Jewish nation indefinitely. He told them to do these feasts 
He said, do them forever. He wasn't talking to you. He was talking to them. Those seven feasts that I mentioned and those added ones, he said, you do those forever. Don't worry. I'll pick it up later on in your lives, in your children's lives. And what, by the time we get to Revelation, you'll see some strange things happening. The 144,000 are going to come on the scene. You'll see the Antichrist come on the scene. Uh, you, 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 we're now into the tribulation and then the great tribulation. God is, is then begin to test them through in that time. You are who are of the body of Christ. Well, if you believe in the rapture, you can answer that for me. Oh, if the first Jewish Christians were redeemed, then the, the Gentiles needed to remember that every Jew is redeemable. So first fruits is used as a metaphor to mean the first part of the harvest of Jewish souls that are to be saved through Christ's salvation. Mm. So 1 Corinthians 15 and 20 refer to Jesus as first fruits of those. There we go, Tamara. I don't know if you're still here, uh, Tamara, but you asked the question, is Jesus the first fruit? I'm about to answer your question. Yeah. Um... Well, he says, bro, well, like I said to you yesterday, churches don't preach this because we stuck on the Sunday school lesson. But we don't read and study the Bible deeper. Now, nothing's wrong with Sunday lesson, but we need to study and pray for understanding. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yes. Um, so Tamara asked the question, but she knows the answer, but she's pushing the question because she needs y'all to understand the concept. Uh, it's true and sad. If we realize we are all children of God and respect each other, anointing. Come on, Janine Joe. I'm always glad to see you here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 referred to Jesus as the first fruits of those who will be raised from the dead. He is the firstborn son of the Father. And his resurrection is the first of the promise that all who follow him will also be raised. He is a guarantee of our future blessing. He is the guarantee of our first fruit, our first fruit blessing. Y'all keep singing and preaching about the blessing of Abraham. I'm afraid to tell y'all that the blessing of Abraham is not money. It's not wealth. It's not. Now, some of you probably are seeing where I'm going with these lessons. Yes, uh, over the weekend I talked about uh, how to tithe in 2019. Today I'm talking about first fruit. My next lesson I'm going to talk about sowing seed. My next lesson I'm going to talk about the blessing of Abraham. Okay. Next lesson I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about decreeing and declaring. Y'all know why I'm doing these lessons? Can anybody put in the comments why Sir Walter deciding to do these lessons like this separate? Anybody want to know why I'm doing these lessons? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> okay, I'll let y'all answer it now. Maybe I can read it when I get a chance. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 13 and James 1 and 18 kind of go together. These two, they go together. Uh, call New Testament saints, they call them first fruits. And they were the first to follow Christ and act as, as a promise that there would be more to come. We are the first fruits, and more are to come. James 1 and 18 says, uh, infers that the Christians in the early church were the first fruits of all the creation, and the promise that uh, creation itself will be restored. There's no money there. There's no food there. Mm -hmm. To get a clear understanding of rightly dividing the... Come on, Lenora. I think you own to something. You are c countering false teachings uh-huh, that equate to money. Come on, Tamara, I think y'all got the answer. I think y'all, I figured if I separate these teachings and use scripture, let you see the scripture for yourself, take it home like the Berean church and study for themselves, then you will get the whole understanding. Somebody in our churches didn't do this. They didn't do this when I was coming up because somebody didn't do it to them. And then when they get, came into the, the, uh, the, they had the ability to read for themselves, they did not read it. And so what happens? Y'all keep talking about the Catholic Church. They have to go to the priest for everything. 
Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And the, the, the Catholic Church has a history of not allowing you to read it and understand it for yourself. They wrote it. They, the, the scriptures were written in Latin. And if you was at home and you had Bible study with your children, they crucified you. They burned you at the stake. The only one who was able to interpret the scriptures was the priests and the popes and the cardinals and, and all these people. All right. Well, that's what's happening in the New Testament. And, and, and y'all, when I say New Testament, your church today, the Pentecostal church, you still go to the pastor and the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists for everything. You won't read it for yourself. And I had an art, not an argument. I don't argue with the scriptures, but I had a discussion with a young lady on the wall about tithing. And I was giving her scripture after scripture on proper tithing. And she was rejecting it all by going with what she was taught in church. Her vernacular was church vernacular. And she was like, and then what told me that cognitive dissonance had overtaken her is when I got to the, towards the end of the, the subject matter. And I says, but here, did you not read this for yourself? And out of her mouth, she says, it doesn't matter what it says. I know what I believe. And then I ended that discussion right away because I realized no matter what I present to her in scripture, it won't matter. Her mind is made up as if she had been turned over to a reprobate. It doesn't matter what the scriptures say. I know what I believe. Yes. I'm trying to tell you. So what does that say? Is the spirit of God operating in many of you? I don't believe it does. I don't believe the Spirit operates in many of you for you to go and grieve the Holy Spirit like that. Even when the scriptures are hitting you in the face, you will not, re you refuse to read it because there's some kind of fear that if you, if you read it, it's going to be like uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 talked about the law was facing him, but the power of sin was in him and the power of sin kept rising up looking at the law, and he said, I died. He said, whoa, I'm just a wretched soul. But then, as you keep reading, it says, now therefore, there is no condemnation in whom? And so I believe that these people are caught in a black hole, and they have not reached the now therefore. You hear me? There are too many Christians who have never reached the now therefore. They can't. They're struggling. Yep, yep. Come on, Brother Bass. We're in trouble. Um, the first fruit. The concept of the first fruit is sometimes used by preachers today to encourage their parishioners to give an offering above and beyond tithing. So uh, they finagle a way to get money out of you through compulsory. They, they use scare tactics. And they use these uh, weak promises. It's usually the promises are mostly on natural promises. It's all usually wealth, uh, uh, finances. It's, it's uh, some kind of blessing in the finances area here. Okay. And then sometimes it's used in the spirit. But the people know that they know, these manipulators know that spiritually it's too weak for many of you because spiritually your bills ain't getting paid. You still got the repo man coming after your car, all right? You still want that new job. So they don't, they don't really fool around the spirit too much. They have to go in the old way, all right? The first fruit itself may vary in their teachings. They say first paycheck to a new job or the first paycheck of the year, uh, portions earned from the sale of something, or you give the portion of each subsequent paycheck, or take a Sabbath the first day of the week and or have a quiet time in the morning. Uh, the reason stated for giving a first fruit offering is also very uh, uh, to show sacrificial faith that God will provide and to give thanks that God did provide to sow a seed so that God will make the giver rich uh, to ensure God will bless the giver's plans for the new year. All these things are ways to get you to give a first fruit. And the problem is the first fruits offering was for the Jews for a specific purpose. It was not for you. It was for the Jews. 
Nowhere does the New Testament mention that the church is required or even encouraged to give a first fruit offering. Nowhere. Like tithing given to the church is left up to the person convictions of the individual believer. There is no blanket policy for giving. No blanket policy for giving. When Jesus came on the scene in Matthew, what is it, 23, he was talking to the Pharisees and he was telling them, you do a good thing by tithing of your small portion of your crop, uh, the cumin and the mint and the spices. He said, you do that, you do a good thing. He says, but you're forgetting a weightier matter. You're forgetting something a little more important. What is that? He said, justice and faith and mercy. You're forgetting those. So while the people are beating you up for not doing this, those same people are beating you up for not doing tithe and first fruits are the ones who are forgetting a weightier matter. So I put up a post today about uh, do you tithe to the poor? And I was waiting for somebody to be very deep and a couple of people were. Thank God many of you said you did tithe, but I still don't think that most of you understand the post. I still don't think most people understood the post when I said, do you tithe to the poor? I do not tithe to the poor. I do not. I don't. Why? Because tithe is taking 10% of your, um, your reap, okay, whatever you did and you got back, taking 10% of that and giving it to whatever you want to give it. I don't give 10. I give New Testament way of giving that is not under compulsion. I haven't dedicated 10% of my salary to the poor. I just give upon the need. If they need, then I give it to them. I, I, when I see someone in need, whether it's your child who need books because they're in college, I'll just send money. Okay, or I go to the soup kitchen or I go somewhere or I or give somebody some gas money. Or I've paid utilities. I've paid cell phone bills. I've paid light bills. I've done that because there was a need. I don't tithe to the poor. I give. If you look at my show on tithing in 219, notice there was a custom of tithing. There was a law of tithing. And then there was the grace. I give under both custom and grace. It is customary to be good and nice and kind to someone. That is customary. God has placed it in all of us. When you tithe to something, you then you're doing it up under compulsion and fear in many cases, and you're doing it up under a law. So, I don't tithe to the poor. I give to them as, a, as there is a need. Anybody understand that? Doing the same, I am part of the church. Come on. Yeah, come on. I mean, let me see here. This thing is slowing down. Y'all said a whole lot. Okay. I don't tithe either. I thank you. So, thank you so much. Yes. Yes. There it is. Thank you. All right. So please, people, if you say you tithe to the poor, that's telling me you're probably tithing to the church as well. Someone said on my wall, and, she, and I love what she said, and I went, I went against what she said I wasn't talking to her. I was talking to the general audience, but I was using her as a, you know, as a, as a, I don't know, as a, as a pet. <laughs> she knew who I'm talking about. She said, yeah, I, yeah, I tied to the poor before I tied to the church. So I says, would you be driving or walking? Well, most of you drive to church. Would you be driving to church and see a, a naked baby, a naked child who's hungry? And you tell this child, wait until I get to the church. Would you do that? Many of you tithe that way. You, would, you give to the church first, and then you decide to give to other people, give to the poor people. You are doing the same thing that these people who Jesus talked about, the, the Good Samaritan, and he used two people in particular. When you look at the story of the Good Samaritan, notice the two people who walked by this person that was beat up on the, on the street. He used two people who was very important in the temple. Can some of you put on the comments, who are these two people of prominence who walk by this, this person who's beat up? But the, but the person who stopped is the person who is despised. That's the person who stopped to help this man. 
Yeah, that's some of you. This presumes that the work of God be understood in a dispensation manner instead of following the teaching of replacement theology. Now, remember I used the word replacement theology earlier in this lesson. Replacement theology teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan for the world. This, I think, is one of the most dangerous teachings in the body of Christ today. It is why we are so confused today. Replacement theology is taking the name Israel crossing it out and putting the name church. And that means everything in the Old Testament from the blessings of Abraham to the first fruit to the tithe, okay, to a whole lot of stuff. But one thing that they don't do, there's a lot of the Levitical laws that they will not do. Y'all still eat catfish, okay? Y'all still eat a lot of the forbidden uh, foods and you still do a lot of the forbidden things that are in the law, but you pick and choose certain things. So you crossed out Israel and put church in there and you decided to take all this stuff and then transfer it to the New Testament church. And you wonder why it's empty and it's not working because replacement theology is probably one of the most dangerous things that you could ever do. It's dangerous, extremely. Mm-hmm. Israel cannot be replaced. The Bible even says, come on, Bronia. Woo-wee. Yes. It's false teaching. Please don't get caught up in that. A replacement theology teaches uh, that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan for the world. All of the promises God gave Israel, including material blessings for obedience, are transferred to the church. That's their, that's their teaching. Dispensational theology claims that God gave Israel and the church different promises and many of Israel's promises will not come to fruition until the millennial kingdom. I talked about that earlier and it is the belief of this ministry that dispensational theology best interprets the scriptures. I did that teaching on theology, uh, dispensationalism. It's on my YouTube channel. Uh, the church cannot claim all the promises God made to Israel in the old Testament. Please church. Those of you who call yourself the church, if you call yourself the church, if you call yourself Christians, okay, please know, those of you who are of the Ecclesia, please stop teaching and stop being taught that you will receive all of the promises of the Old Testament. It's not working for you. That doesn't mean that giving a first fruit offering is bad in of itself like the term or even the practice tithing first fruit can be used as a sort of shorthand to mean voluntary offering give in thanks uh, or faith there's nothing wrong with giving above and beyond what is regularly budgeted for as long as the motivation is personal and not pressured by church leadership so if you go to my lesson over the weekend when I talked about tithing in 2019 notice what how I opened up I said if a person decides to take 10% of his or her earnings and dedicate it to the work of God, that is their private, personal covenant with God. That is their agreement with God and leave them alone. They have their own little testimonies they are, they, and they, they talk about their own little stories of how God blesses them and their own little covenants. Leave them alone. I decide to do something else with my money, leave me alone. Understand? So if a person wants to do first fruit and they decided to give a first portion of their monies and then take 10% of their tithe and then do another uh, uh, a volunteer offering after that, that is up to them to do whatever they want to do with their money, leave them alone. My teaching last week though is what to do with the 90 percent that's left my focus was on the 90 percent and not the 10 okay go to that show on my youtube channel and i give you a whole bunch of things to do with the 90 percent that the church don't teach about they can't they don't know how 
can't you just bring in a day a Dave Ramsey type person to come in and say, now after y'all giving this money on Sunday, you need to survive Monday through Saturday. So we're gonna bring in a financial advisor, Bible study Tuesday night, and he going he or she gonna help you figure out this ninety percent, get your credit report up, teach you how to invest maybe in a stock, in a bond or a commodity or these ETFs. Okay help you get your social media up and going so that you could do maybe a, a Facebook ads and talk about your branding and all this stuff with the 90. Yeah, that, 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 now that's a great church right there. I, I go to that church. Uh-huh. Has Walter lost his license yet? <laughs> hey, okay. Yeah, come on, come on. I lost, they done tore my license up so many times. So the ways in which churches use the phrase and the practice vary in theological truth to say that laying down a seed so that God will make someone rich or that you can pay off God to bless future plans is an abusive lie from adherents uh, of the prosperity gospel. And to give sacrificially is to follow the example of the widow. Anybody give the widow might? Y'all talking about giving a sacrificial offering? Please. Though the most people, the average person who give what's called a sacrificial offering still got money at home. A and is uh, commendable as long as it isn't coerced. To give an offering in thanks that God provided is perfectly acceptable, but if a church wants to have a period of fundraising, it would be better to have a specific purpose and not just try to spiritualize the desire to have more capital in the bank. So they're lying to you. They're telling you these, these things are going to happen to you if you give this particular seed uh, after the second uh, the third offering, sometimes the fourth offering, because the guest preacher didn't preach, and now the guest preacher raises his own offering after he speaks. Trust me, when the guest preacher didn't rail back and he, ah, 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 and I heard, ah, ah, and the Hammond organ is going forth and he's hooping, okay, and hollering or what have you, what y'all call closing, and then he calms down and he's beginning to talk. When he begins to talk to you, get your pocketbook ready. Get it ready, because he's getting ready to ask for a seed. Now, where that seed going? Partial part of it is going to him, and the other part is going to the church. Why? Because in many cases, that is an arrangement that's made. That's what's happening. So the church gave a benevolent offering, then they gave a first fruit offering, then they gave a tithe, coupled with the offering and then the speaker got up and they gave a speaker's offering and then the speaker gets up and raises another offering after his sermon and the people know this so they leave home with five dollars one for every offering I'm trying to tell y'all I've been in this church a long time long time uh, the, this brings to mind the purpose of the New Testament gives uh, for church offering. First Timothy 5 and 17 says that the church should support those who run the church. Now I'm in scripture. Now I'm going to satisfy those on the other side. First Corinthians 9 14 says that those who preach the gospel should be supported by their work. I preach the gospel. I have a cash app. Sir Walter J is my cash app. But I really ask y'all to give. Mm -hmm. I don't do these sermons to give. I'm going to put my cash app here, though. Why is it? Sir Walter J. That's my cash app right there. I really do that, really. But I can back it up in Scripture. says whoever preached the gospel or teach it to you, you should, you should try and support them because I'm going to preach some more. I'm going to buy me a bigger board. I'm going to buy me a better camera. More lighting, because those lights are expensive. They, once they blow, that, that light, one light bulb right there cost me about $10, $15 <laughs> for that one bulb over there. It's a, it's a 500 watt bulb. And it, when it blow, it's flickering right now. When it blow, I got to, there ain't no store up the street. I got to go travel miles to, to get that bulb or go to Amazon and wait a few days. So, Sir Walter J is the cash app. Or, you can go to my email, Gifted Friends. Uh huh. Gifted Friends. Yep, I still use AOL.com. 
<laughs> I do. I still use AOL, y'all. Get the friends at AOL. You can do a PayPal. Yes, you can. Because mm -hmm. some of y'all are like, where's your PayPal? What is it? PayPal forward slash, what is it? PayPal.me forward slash Sir Walter. It's, it's, it could be confusing. All right. Anyway, that's what the scriptures say. Hey, what does it say here? Give to those who are teaching. Uh, several times in the New Testament, exhorting believers to give to those who are in need. Matthew 25, 34. 1 John 3, 17. The New Testament says we are to give in faith. But it doesn't say that we are to give to the point of destitution so that our faith can grow. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I've seen so many preachers get up and say, give to it hurts. Who told y'all to do this mess? Give to it hurts. Give your last. I mean, I, I howl and groan and, and all this stuff. Just give every, I break the bank. Stuff like that. It is heresy. And it is, it is not the proper way to invest in yourself or in the kingdom. It is not the proper way to do it. No. There is a difference between faithful sacrifice and bad resource management. Bad. These people hadn't paid their bills at home, but you're telling them to give till it hurts. Now the lights are being shut off, the gas is being shut off, and there's no food in the refrigerator. And can you, can you not see the harm that you're doing to the families? Who said they support to get rich off the church? I wait. <laughs> They're supposed to get rich. <laughs> Yet yeah, it's stupidity and should be corrected. Alexis, Alexis, you know what? You and I need to run. We need to find a witness protection program. As far as the first fruit offering is, as I'm going to shut this down. I got two paragraphs to read. As far as the first fruit offering is described in the Old Testament, the church is exempt. Did you hear me? The church is exempt. Jesus did not come to abolish the law. I said that, but he came to fulfill it, including being the first fruit himself. He is the first fruit, y'all. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20. If the usage of the term first fruit in the New Testament is to be considered, the manifestation of first fruit in the church age means that those who were saved in the early church were a promise that more would follow. And Jesus' resurrection is a promise that we too will be resurrected. And any other use of first fruits is either abusive or careless, and there are better terms to use when the church collects a special offering. And there are more biblical ways to do so than to insist or uh, conjole or uh, threaten people to give. It is dangerous to do that. God's going to punish you for that. He's getting ready to judge the church. Church, uh, your faith can grow if you're homeless and hungry. That's a lie from the pit. <laughs> pits. Notice she said that's a lie from the pits. Who said that? Demetri Pitts. Boy, that's a clever way of using your, your last name. Ironically, what the New Testament teaches about giving is more extreme. God wants all of us, Romans 12 and 1. Because of that, every monetary blessing we have is who? He is. And we should do with it as he leads us to do with it. Whether to use on ourselves or to use for others, Matthew 25 and 14 tells us that we should be responsible with his blessings and this would include giving for a purpose giving by the leading of the bible and the holy spirit and giving for the spread of the gospel and the aid of the needy and giving cheerfully whatever you choose to call it it's simply christian giving they're saying here it's the body of christ it is just simple giving you should do it because you love the people you have the fruit of the spirit God has left you, get, given you the, the income and the money and the, and the assets and the resources that you have. Some of you have your own businesses, your entrepreneurs, and he made you wealthy or well off or he's given you just enough so that you can be responsible with your money. And he gave it to you, not for you. He gave it to you for someone else. You, even your health, your health and your wealth whether your health is mental or physical, all right, or financial or spiritual, everything he given to you is not directly to you. It is for someone else. You'll get it. When you give it to someone else, 
you'll get it. <laughs> the great chef is the one who cooks, but he tastes his own food. He puts enough ingredients in there and sometimes he didn't got to measure. Some of these guys are so good. Some of y'all out there, y'all so good that y'all just, y'all know how much salt and pepper and spices to put in there. All right. You don't need a measuring cup. But then what you do, you better taste it. I watched Hell's Kitchen. Is that what it's called? Um, Chef Ramsay. And he'd be looking at them and they, they put that plate on the food on the plate and, and, and send it to the patrons. And he said, hey, hey, did you taste that? How are you going to send that out there and you didn't taste it? So you just trust your mind, okay? Well, that's what's happening. You are going to be the first fruit. God bless you, so you're the first fruit. Now that you've been strengthened, strengthen your brother. Strengthen your sister, okay? So he says, if you give to them, you're lending to God. It's the great lending tree. All right, y'all. Mm -hmm. We are blessed so we can be a blessing to others. That's exactly it. So I do these shows, I've been doing them for years for free. Why? Because I want you to get what I got. I want you to receive what I receive. Knowledge, they say, is power. But I believe more so knowledge is potential power. Why? Because if you don't use it, you are powerless. It's like love. Love isn't love till you give it away. I've learned as a young man that the best teacher is the one who make you want to learn, not force you to learn. I did horrible in school because it was, I felt like I was forced to get this stuff. But I met a teacher who made it so enjoyable and broke it down in such plain English. And he had such a great um, manner about himself such a people's person, he was personable, that he made me want to learn this stuff. And so I learned it. So here I am. I want you to learn it so that you can live it and then teach it to your children at home. When they wake up, teach it to them. All right? When they go out, teach it to them. Put it on their forehead. Put it on their chest. Put it in their Nike shoes. Or, just put it somewhere in them so when they go out, they could be great teachers themselves. They could be model citizens. And somebody gonna look at them and say, that's a great young man, that's a great young lady, and I don't even know why. What is it about this child? Because you taught it to them, all right? So help America, because the life you save just might be mine. All right, I gotta go. Pray for, for yes, pray for sound doctrine, Brother Bass. We need it. We are just, we, we're caught up in all of these, this hocus pocus type, type of teaching. And it is bad. This teaching that we're getting today is bad. It's dangerous. And y'all ain't learning nothing. So stop. Stop with all of this. Read this for understanding and learning. Hopefully you won't repeat this. Okay? That's what history is for. So that you won't repeat it. Study it. Understand it. Come over here, check this out, live this way, and then you will be made, uh, you will be made whole. Some of you are half saints. <laughs> Some of you are not of the body, you are just of the hand. Study the Old Testament. Get all you can. Get to the New Testament. Study it. And then become whole. And understand the purpose of why Jesus Christ came. He came for the world. Not just for you. And those Jews of the Old Testament leading into the, the, uh, the four Gospels. Because the four Gospels are still a part of the Old Testament. Many of them still were separatists. They were bigots. They were xenophobes, okay, which y'all may call racist today because they thought that Jesus was going to come and wipe out these, these Romans and these Greeks and, and, every, and everybody, just wipe them out and set up his kingdom and it was just going to be us and us only. That's it. And Jesus said, get behind me, devil. And Peter's like, wait, hold up, hold up. Wait, wait, what? How, how is this possible? 
He said, I didn't come for that. I didn't, I didn't come to do that. I came to win the entire world. Not just you. And then what did he do? He allowed those three on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is a whole nother story here. Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, and he used those three because he knew that they the one was going to further the gospel all the way through the scriptures. And they did. Separatists, xenophobes, still they were. And he told Peter, put him to sleep and say, hey, here's a sheet of meat. These, this meat is forbidden for you as a Jew. Peter was like, I can't eat that. And God says, how dare you say what I made is unclean. You better eat this. What was he doing? God was preparing this xenophobe to witness to you. You who are of Cornelius' house. Peter was a bigot, a xenophobe, but he also was a hypocrite because he was living in the house of a tanner. Anybody know what's, what a tanner does? He was living around a dead thing and telling God that these people are unclean and he waking up and going to sleep around dead stuff. God says, get up and go witness to my people. How dare you? That's what some of you do because they're not a part of your denomination. You say, away with them. You better stop this. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a xenophobe in the spirit. Okay. I don't care if they spit in your face. I don't care if they call you all kind of names. I don't care if they cuss at you. You witness to them. Stop being a weak saint. You witness to them and make your face like flint. Don't worry about the naysayers. And don't worry about those who are unbelievers. Don't worry. You do the work of an evangelist. Reprove and rebuke and correct. And then love on them. And then they'll know that you are his disciples by your love. I got to go. I think I've done enough damage. I hear a ripping sound of my license in the air. God, I love you and I thank you for your wonderful scriptures, your words. In the beginning was this word. This word was with God and the word was God. And we thank you for allowing the word to grip our hearts and rest in us and our souls. Thank you, God, for helping us to teach this word that somebody out there might get it. God, we repent for our sins. And we ask those who are out there who didn't know, now that they know, to come into the knowledge of the truth that they might do better and teach it to their children so that they might lead a more peaceful life among the world of sin. We thank you, God. We bless your name today. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God and amen. Hit the share button if you please. If you're on YouTube, go Hit that bell. Y'all know the bell. And um, subscribe. All that stuff. All right. Got to go. Be blessed in Jesus Christ's name. Lenore Griffin. It's got the last say. Good night. Sleep tight.